Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Peter Atkinson. Peter is a professor of entomology at the University of California, Riverside, where he has held numerous scientific and administrative leadership positions. Peter's research has focused on the development of genetic strategies for the control of pest insect species. His work was instrumental in developing the earliest insect genetic modification technologies used to produce transgenic mosquitoes and other insects. He has worked on insects of both medical and agricultural importance. More recently, he has turned his considerable knowledge and expertise in genetic insect technologies to a group of insects that cause tremendous economic losses, but for which there are relatively few genomic and genetic resources. He is closing those gaps, as you'll hear today, and thinking about how genetics might be used to control some of these insects. Peter, it's great to have you with us this morning. And at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. So thanks for the invitation, Dave, and thanks uh, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today on uh, what we've been doing for the past uh, three and a half to five years on two pests of agriculture. One of those is the uh, glassy wing sharpshooter and the other one is the whitefly. And as Dave pointed out, uh, what I'm going to try and uh, uh, illuminate today is the progress we've made on developing CRISPR-mediated uh, gene editing in both of these species. And the thought that I want you to hold in your head as I'm talking is um, if we've been able to really develop these technology, technologies relatively quickly to different extents in sharpshooter and whitefly, then how feasible is it to then start applying these technologies to come up with genetic control strategies for these pests, whether it be gene drive or any other genetic approach? And what I would like you to take away, perhaps at the end of this uh, of this seminar, this webinar, is um, is that really um, you know, the sky's the limit? That many of the approaches that we wish to establish now are quite feasible. So the outline of the webinar is that I will very quickly um, introduce CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Um, I'm sure that regular uh, attendees of these webinars, webinars will know exactly what this is. I will introduce uh, two contrasting examples from our laboratory at uh, Riverside, um, two Hemiptera, uh, sharpshooter, Homolodisca vitro penis. I'm just gonna call it GWSS for the, uh, for the duration of the webinar or sharpshooter. It's an invasive pest of California, so it's pretty regional. And then the whitefly Bermesia tabassi, which is in contrast to global pest of agriculture. And as we get into the webinar, you'll see that they have uh, quite different um, life cycles, life histories, which presents some challenges and opportunities. I will talk about the challenges and the opportunities. They go hand in hand. They are uh, the same reverse sides of the same equation. Uh, the challenges in general with the MIPTRA is that, as David mentioned, there are little or no genetic tools previously established. So more or less, we're starting from scratch. Uh, there are endosymbionts present in these insects, and they have um, very intimate relationships with their host to the point where they cannot, uh, the host cannot live without them. So as I think you know, many, uh, many tech, several genetic technologies rely on the presence or absence of an antibiotic like you know, doxycycline in the uh, rearing media or the water, uh, we can't use those in Hemiptera. So that removes one aspect or one tool that uh, is is used in um, in some mosquito and uh, tifridid applications. Uh, another big difference is uh, embryo accessibility. Um, unlike uh, tifridids, mosquitoes, um, both screwworm, both males and females inflict damage to the host plant for Hemiptera. So if we're talking about a control strategy, we have to remember that males can cause as much damage as females. And uh, as I said, we have a pretty large catch-up catch, catch up gap to the other systems. The opportunities are that when you're confronted with challenges, you can you have the, the privilege of trying to figure out new approaches which can in themselves solve the problem and, and, and uh, introduce new areas of knowledge that we knew nothing about. So very quickly, if we're talking about CRISPR, it's a form of mutagenesis and how it differs from previous forms of mutagenesis that have been used in genetics, but here I'm talking primarily about mosquitoes, 
is that all the previous versions, whether they were naturally occurring mutations, chemicals, X-rays, or transposable elements, uh, randomly inserted into the genome or caused random damage through the genome. And as geneticists, we didn't have a lot of control, if any, about where these went. There were some refinements made to transposable element mediated integration later on in the 20th century and early in this one, but still there was a little lack of control over where these things inserted. And CRISPR really makes the difference because it's template driven and we have exquisite control of where these mutations occur. And so this is what has led to the revolution in medicine, in agriculture, and what uh, what the focus of this and previous webinar series have been from um, FNIH. So as we heard from a seminar here in our own department a few weeks ago, quote unquote, with CRISPR, the sky is the limit in a sense about in terms of what you may be able to do with developing genetic control in uh, in, in pest insects. The ones, the, the boxes in orange below just simply show some uh, technological developments in genetic control going back to Nippling's work, um, the uh, advent of transposable element mediated uh, transformation in medflies and mosquitoes in the last decade of the last century, and then uh, and some riddle uh, development of the riddle technology by Luke Elfie's group uh, in the early parts of this century. So here's CRISPR mutagenesis. There's a very nice video in the top right hand corner, which is really showing how it works. Uh, you've seen this before. It's template driven. It's a ribonuclear protein generated by a Cas9 endonuclease that is binding to a guide RNA. Excuse me, simply put, you can control, you can synthesize um, part of the sequence of the guide RNA to make it absolutely specific to the target site in the genome. You can then introduce that ribonuclear complex into the genome. That can be a huge challenge at the moment in many applications. It's a uh, it's a rate limiting step. It's a step that we had to overcome with Hemiptra, as I'll illustrate soon. Once this has happened, a double strand break is made at the uh, cut site, which is three base pairs upstream from a PAM site. Uh, and then at that point, uh, the CRISPR Cas9 ribonuclear protein has done its job, and this double strand break that's in the chromosome is then repaired by, in general, one of two rep DNA repair pathways. So this is the cell going about its normal business. Um, the typical, most common pathway used is called non-homologous end joining. Um, it's efficient, but it actually is quite messy in how it makes repairs. Usually you have in, uh, indels or base pair changes. The other pathway is the HDR or homology directed pathway which makes precise genome editing. So this is great here, these NHEJ is a laboratory tool, but if we're talking about applications in the field, typically we want a higher level of control over what the editing is, and that requires the HDR pathway. I'll talk about a variation on non homologous end joining later on. Cas9 can be purchased, guide RNAs can be made or purchased. Uh, this is quite simple to do these days. And of course you need a genome project that you have confidence in in order to um, in order to design those guide RNAs with some confidence that they will only go to a unique site in the genome. So why focus on Hemiptera now? Um, I would say, as David introduced, I've been, do I've been doing this for a while. And before CRISPR came along, I don't think it was, I, I think it's fair to say it would not be feasible at all to contemplate any form of genetic control in Hemiptera because of the limitations of the mutagenesis technology that was available to us before 2012 or 2013. But now with CRISPR, which has been transformational, actually one can contemplate uh, doing genetic manipulations in these insects that have really not been the focus of these types of studies. Well, they should be the focus of these studies because plant diseases and invasive pests of plants cause global economic losses of almost $300 billion annually. And of these, the sap feeding hemiptera are the major contributors. They can do this by direct feeding and overwhelming the plant um, by taking so much phloem in the case of whiteflies. But also in the case of both whiteflies and sharpshooter, uh, they can vector bacterial or viral plant pathogens, which kill the plant. And then as we, we know that uh, chemical insecticides have been used uh, for many, many decades, plant um, insect pest resistance is inevitable. The insecticides are broad spectrum. They also have an impact on beneficial insects 
and they leave toxic residues. And much of what drives us is to find uh, safe green alternatives to the use of these chemical insecticides. So let's introduce the two pests that we work on. One is uh, the glassy wing sharpshooter, Homolisca vitropenis. It's about 12, meters, 12 millimeters in length. It's, uh, it's quite an unusual looking insect. Uh, it's large. It's actually good to work with a large insect. But if you get bored with that, you can work with white flies. And you can see here are the adult white flies. They're mating. They uh, have this very interesting behavior of getting close to each other in pairs or triplets uh, um, prior to mating. And they're a millimeter long. And um, that's quite a challenge in looking at the white flies. And it's an extraordinarily challenge in looking at the eggs, which are typically about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters in length. Let's focus for the first part on sharpshooters. I'll come back to white flies in about uh, 25 minutes time. Has a broad range of plant hosts. It transmits why it's a pest, why it terrifies um, wine growers, uh, grape growers in um, California is that it transmits a bacteria called Zyvala fastidiosa. Um, it can vector viruses and it is a vector of a virus that inf impacts citrus, but we're focused on uh, Zyvala here feeds on woody material, it can achieve high population densities, and it's highly mobile and capable of wide dispersal. This is just an example of some of the crops that in California that it uh, impacts. Um, and from um, Rodrigo Krugner's lab up uh, in uh, Central Valley here, there's an electron micrograph uh, showing the bacteria, uh, occluding the uh, xylem channel of an infected plant. So basically, when an infected sharpshooter feeds on an uninfected plant, it introduces xylella, the xylella uh, reproduces, it generates a biofilm in the xylem, water, it blocks the xylem tubes, water cannot get from the roots to the leaves and, and, the, and the plant dies. And you can actually see this happening uh, quite, um, quite clearly with the olive groves down here in the bottom right hand corner. So it's a serious pest. It invaded, it's an invasive pest of California. It invaded sometime in the 80s and the 90s. Um, you can see there uh, the uh, size of the uh, wine and grape industry in California and the uh, substantial um, business that it generates both in California and in the United States. The existing control strategies are dealing with keeping it in Southern California. The map on the right shows where it is at the moment. It, uh, had decimated the, uh, the vineyards down in Temecula, south of here. Uh, and uh, its control is by chemical insecticides, and we now see resistance emerging, and also through strict quarantine to prevent it from getting up uh, past Kern County here, up higher into the Central Valley and, uh, and into um, uh, the vineyards around uh, the Bay Area. When we're working with developing CRISPR technology in uh, a new insect, um, there are many, many steps we need to go through. And simply put, I'm going to walk you through these first seven because we've been able to achieve this in the sharpshooter in the uh, three and a half years that we've been uh, funded and working intensively on it. And I simply put this up as a potential exemplar for how you can solve some of these problems in order to get to the point Whereas we are now with sharpshooter, we're talking about, okay, let's, can we actually make this resistant to xylella and can we contemplate the uh, uh, ge genetic technologies for it? Uh, there are many attractive features about uh, sharpshooter. Um, females lay the uh, eggs in an egg mass. They lay them uh, next to each other and uh, they line it up for us. Those of you who have done uh, Drosophila, Mosquito, Many, many types of injections will know that it takes a lot of time to line these embryos up. Sharpshooter is great. The female does all the work for you. She lines them up and she lines them up in the same orientation, anterior to posterior. And you can tell where the anterior end is because of the uh, brocosomes that uh, she leaves around the anterior site, you know, which is where she does the uh, overposition. Uh, they take about seven days to develop. And because it's a hemimetabolous insect, um, we can actually start to see the adult body plan form in the late stages of embryogenesis uh, and certainly in the nymphs. And that means that we can score for adult phenotypes, if you like, late some adult phenotypes late in embryogenesis. And as you can soon see, we're using eye color and you'll get some examples of that very quickly. Um, we have scaffold and chromosomal assemblies for sharpshooters. So during the course of this project, that has enabled us to do, uh, I'd say, high-quality bioinformatics. We'll talk see those in just a few moments. 
We have figured out how to genotype uh, uh, sharpshooter in a non-sacrificial way using uh, genomic DNA prepared from their exuvia. Um, sharpshooter and whitefly, as all hemiptera, have holocentric chromosomes. I may go into that with uh, gene drive later on, but um, but just be, bear that, that in mind that it's very different from diptera. It has an XOXX system for sex determination, so that enables the potential to manipulate the sex ratio. And we worked out how to do pair matings and do genetics uh, as part of this project. So I talked about the egg masses. Here they are in close-up. Uh, one of the cute things we found is that not only does the female do the work for us, but unlike any other insect I've worked with, I'm sure this must happen in others, but this is the first eye case I've seen, that a day after micro-injection, we have a melanization scar left at the uh, point of entry of the uh, quartz needle we use for injection towards the posterior end. And that gives us a really great uh, measurement of how many we actually injected. Sometimes you think you've injected something and you may not have. Well, you can actually see down here that the scars enable us to um, see what we've injected. Uh, they occur a day after. And we use the leaf disc system that we developed for whitefly to actually uh, secure these on a Petri dish so that once the nymphs hatch, they're uh, contained. So how do we do CRISPR knockout mutagenesis? We uh, used uh, two eye color genes, uh, white and cinnabar. I'm sure they are known to you from uh, other insect work. We looked, we designed guides to uh, specific uh, functional domains in the proteins of both white and cinnabar. We did some injections and I just draw your attention to the last two columns, which simply show the percent mosaics relative to the numbers of injected uh, embryos in, in the last column numbers to the hatched nymphs. So if we just go for the conservative estimate uh, for white, we have between 44 and 25% uh, contingent on the amount of Cas9 we put in, and for cinnabar, 32% um, transformation frequencies. And I will say that for all the experiments we've done in sharpshooter, I'm only talking about white and cinnabar and reversions today, uh, even for um, genes which do not produce a demonstrable phenotype in, in uh, embryos or nymphs, we have never failed with transgenesis in sharpshooter. So this is what they look like. Um, here's examples of wild type in the top row, cinnabar and white in the bottom row. Uh, if you really want a very quick somatic assay for screening, these are the G0 embryos about five days post-injection. Here's our wild type. You can see the, the eye discs forming. Uh, here's our cinnabar. Uh, you can actually, the picture's worth a thousand words. You can see the mutants there. And then with white, um, you can actually see the mutants there. So this is very different than uh, many mosquito and um, uh, diptera assays where you may have to wait for, uh, for larvae, pupae, adults in order to do screening. We're getting a readout uh, from these leaf discs within five days of micro-injection. Um, well, uh, hemiptera have a slightly different type of germ cell differentiation relative to diptera. I won't go into that here, um, but you, know, you can. it's easy to generate these G0s. The question is, do they transmit these alleles to subsequent generations? So no one had done pair matings before in sharpshooter, as best we could tell. So we simply wanted to see if we could get them to pair mate in cages. We could. It was no great problem. And we did the pair matings. And I'll just quickly run through these in that uh, here are some cinnabar genotypes from the G0 animals. These were mosaics. Uh, we did uh, amplicon sequencing of the parents once they have mated to see the full repertoire of these um, alleles. And then we took the G1s and the G2s from subsequent generations. You can actually see that within those G1 and G2 populations, in the case of cinnabar, we have three alleles segregating and uh, they were actually found in the G0 uh, mosaics of their parents or grandparents. Um, same with white. It's a little more complicated in terms of visualization in that one of our mutations was this very large insertion. So that makes the, the diagram, the, the graph, a little, the figure a little harder to follow. But once again, um, these were inherited. And uh, we actually have these now in uh, G. 12 and G11. So we've been able to maintain these lines for uh, 11 and 12 generations, uh, respectively, with generation time of about 60 days. So there hasn't been any great problem in rearing them. They, they appear to be quite stable. When we looked at white, we made an, un an unexpected discovery. It turns out that 
sharpshooter adults, wild types, have these beautiful red veins and red cells, as morphologists call them, in the forewings. When we looked at our white mutants, we noticed this uh, red color, red pigment was absent from the wings, but it was there in the cinnabar mutants. We did some biochemistry with pigments, and we came to the conclusion that uh, this wing color is actually caused by pteridines uh, and not melanins as had been originally proposed. So this was an unexpected discovery, and it just illustrates what you find as geneticists when you start doing mutagenesis, that you, you, make, you make interesting discoveries. So off targets are a big factor uh, in uh, CRISPR mutagenesis. Um, once again, we have a very good genome, but can we guarantee that we didn't have off target effects? So we decided to look at that through amplicon sequencing. Uh, what we did is that we identified five potential off target genes that may be targeted in sharpshooter per, S per guide RNA that we used. For each, we took five G0 animals and did amplicon sequencing. And then we determined the cutting frequency using uh, this uh, um, uh, established scoring method. And what we found, uh, this is not all the data, but it's a summary just from two guides, is that really with both guide, got white guides 6-1 and 6-2, uh, the vast majority of animals simply had those changes at the target site and nowhere else. Uh, and so we were pretty we were pretty happy that we were being very specific with where we generated um, um, especially indels in uh, these transgenic lines using the amplicon sequencing as the uh, way of looking at these other potential non-sites. And uh, if we were going to use a, a guide here in preference, obviously we use 6-2. Six, six the Cinnabar data were, were pretty much the same as for 6-2. So very little, if any, off-target effects. So the next question we wanted to answer, and so this is now step six in that uh, chart that I was discussing, uh, is can we actually do knock-ins, which occur at a lower frequency than knockouts in the other systems that have been uh, looked at in the last 10 years with CRISPR? Um, what we decided to do, given that we had stable transgenic lines of both cinnabar and white, we figured that we could actually take those lines, which are shown, examples of which are shown over here on the right, and do reversion. In other words, could we do CRISPR mutagenesis on each of these lines, or both of these lines, and add an oligonucleotide uh, to the reaction or to, to the injection mix that would restore these uh, genotypes to the wild type phenotype. So non classical elegant genetics of generating a mutant then reverting it back to wild type and seeing if that uh, changed the phenotype. So this, this uh, it's not a movie, it's, this, it's just this animation shows what we did. I'll just talk you through it. Here's our mutated region. I think at that time we were doing G6 or G7 uh, um, mutants. So here's a mutated allele. And what we're going to do is we're going to design a guide RNA that is new, that is specific to that mutation. And we, if we had heterozygotes, we'd have two guide RNAs in there. We would uh, introduce, we would make that cut, and at the same time, we'd be introducing the wild type sequence for that region with homology arms of several hundred base pairs, uh, in with the injection mix, and HDR then would lead to the replacement of the mutated region in those cinnabar and or white mutants, and we should get a reversion. So we did that. And uh, we did make one change to our injection strategy. Before this, we'd been uh, cutting out leaf discs with egg masses and putting them on phytoagar and injecting on phytoagar. We decided if we could actually see if we could do injections on the living plant. And here's Dylan Brown, who has since left, left the lab um, injecting the patient, which is actually seen here on the left with the this is sorghum. Uh, and uh, underneath here is an egg mass, which you can see here. This is just a diagram of the needle. It's not the real needle. Um, and uh, he's actually injecting an egg mass. And so this particular sorghum plant, for example, may have multiple egg masses on many of the leaves, and we can uh, simply tag them with some um, painter's tape uh, to know where to look. And then what Dylan would be doing here or any of our other uh, injectors or, or our staff or students Postdocs would be uh, injecting all the uh, egg masses here. And actually, if we have, for example, three different constructs to test, we could say use one construct on this leaf and tag it or label it appropriately, a different construct on this leaf, because later we'll be, five days later, we'll be making the leaf discs from these masses, putting them on the phytoagar, and then one or two days later, 
uh, the nymphs will hatch in a contained environment, a petri dish, and we'll be able to collect them. So this is actually a pretty efficient way of doing things these days. And we succeeded, as we did with knockouts, we succeeded pretty much straight away. So what you see here on the left-hand side is what we're now calling the parental, because we these were the cinnabar mutants. These is, this is a nymph, this is an embryo, and you can see that bright red color. And over here is a revertant, um, which can actually, you can actually see this. These, once these are again mosaics, right? These are essentially G zeros. Uh, you can see some wild type eye patch here. And if you looked at uh, white over here, here is our parental on the right. And then down here is, is a revertant. So once again, this is an assay that you can do five days after injection of the egg mass uh, when you're actually transferring, a, creating the leaf disc from an injected mass and putting them on phytoagar and you're getting an answer, you know, five or six days post-injection. So here's just in some more examples. On the top, you can see a cinnabar revert in the dorsal view, the left eye and the right eye, same with white below. The graph on the right shows the, uh, over all these experiments, uh, the percent uh, reversion. So we're getting knock-ins at about 8% for cinnabar and about 10% for white. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy with these frequencies. They're quite, they're quite high uh, in terms of practicalities of doing injections. I think what this means for us is that if we wanted to do knock-in mutagenesis, either in this approach by reversions or putting in new DNA, by sitting down one morning or afternoon and doing a series of raft or egg mass injections, we'd feel pretty confident we'd be able to get these. Well, we just wanted to very quickly look at what else we could find. Um, once again, we're taking these mutant strains, we're doing knock-in mutagenesis, uh, and we decided to do amplicon analysis of these G zeros, which would be injected mutants asking for reversion to wild type, but we wanted to see what other types of mutations we'd be getting in these G zeros as an illustration of how complicated this mutagenesis might be. Be, be aware that, of course, we are selecting for the reversions we want ultimately, but it's we felt it was good practice to see what the mixture of different types of alleles would be from these animals. And here's some answers. So we, we had two, we, we selected two types of phenotypes from these G zeros, one with the revertants. And you can see examples of, of these, and this is just a single embryo. Uh, and you can see a red eye here and a, a darker eye here. This is a one embryo on the right side and the left side. So a red eye on the left and a right eye on the right and uh, so on and so forth. And you can actually see here um, from, the, from the pie charts that these are new editing, event, editing events, so they're knockouts, new cinnabar alleles. This is just for cinnabar, I should point out. Uh, the gray slices are the parentals, uh, and uh, which are the original alleles, and then uh, these, are, these are revertants. So we can see the revertants are being generated at maybe, I don't know, 5% here, 25% here, et cetera, et cetera. So as we would expect, indeed, we get revertants from the, those G zeros that had these patches of wild type reversion, but we're getting new mutagenesis, new cinnabar knockouts as well, and it's quite extensive. If we do it our second class, which are those G zeros which have a parental phenotype, then uh, even though we couldn't see any signs of reversion, you can see that we do pick up some. And our explanation for that is that maybe we missed these here, that they were only occurring at a small scale, or perhaps the reversions weren't occurring in the eyes, they were occurring elsewhere in the somatic tissue of that animal. And of course, we would not see that because we're scoring for the eye phenotype. So this gives us a pretty good idea of how subsequent mutagenesis upon these mutants is working in, uh, in sharpshooter. And uh, this, was, um, this was quite informative. So finally, when we talk about sharpshooter, um, as I said, uh, knock-in mutagenesis is 8 to 10%, that's okay. But if we wanted to get higher levels of knock-in mutagenesis, we could use the non-homologous end joining pathway. And this is a technique called crisp paint that was developed by other geneticists uh, uh, earlier uh, in 2020 and 2016. And basically, this is simply not a perfect repair of the double-strand break. It's an imperfect repair. But if we're looking for a quick technique that we can marry with our somatic assay testing, remember looking at those injected eggs five days after microinjection and asking the question, 
can we see evidence of a promoter driving a fluorescent protein gene, then doing non-homologous end joining and integration is a very quick way to do it uh, and more efficient than uh, non-homologous HDR medi mediated knock-ins. So this is how Chris Paint works. You take a, uh, uh, in this case, in our first experiment, we took a white fly polyubiquitin promoter that we had shown worked in uh, white fly driving M cherry. And this is a Chris Paint plasmid. It's actually a plasmid. We take a guide that cuts upstream in the in the vec in the plasmid sequence, making a double strand break. We use our faithful guide for cinnabar in the sharpshooter genome. So we put these two guides. Uh, along with CAS9 and this plasmid into the injection mix we inject. And what we should see from this animation, if it's going to work, okay, there's our cutting and be patient. This part of the plasmid is going to be moved down. Now, the question you're going to ask, ask is where does, this, where does the second cut occur? Uh, we don't know, um, but if we get signs of M cherry integration, be it by PCR or fluorescence, then that's really all we need to know. And so these are the outcomes. We could get cinnabar knockout, but no integration. We could get cinnabar knockout and total integration. In other words, all this transgene has gone in or uh, maybe partial integration. Uh, so, you know, no, no, no fluorescence. So with this, we didn't get any fluorescence. Uh, we take that as perhaps evidence that whilst this promoter from Whitefly did work, in Whitefly, when we reintroduced it, uh, it wasn't working in M Cherry, sorry, in uh, Sharpshooter. Uh, but we did PCR of uh, these G0 individuals that we injected. And you can see that the frequency of integration as measured by uh, PCR done on, on the transgene, the M Cherry, is actually quite high. And 11 out of 12 G0s actually had that integration. So we struck out with the Whitefly promoter, but we decided uh, to use OPIE2, which was a kind gift from Luke Elfie's lab uh, um, uh, then at the Peerbright. And uh, the, the strategy is the same. I won't go into it. This time we're just using the uh, uh, intermediate early promoter from baculovirus. Uh, we inject it into sharpshooter. And you can see here, here is an embryo uh, from that particular egg mass that has this bright red fluorescence. Now, this is simply not just asking is the plasmid there, it's asking for integration of the plasmid via crisp paint uh, uh, mediated integration. And so what you would expect would be you would have some cells that would take up uh, that particular uh, transgene and then they would be re they would be replicating cell they you would have a, a clone of cells then being made in the organism and that would grow with time uh, through development. So that's what we've been seeing. We do see some examples in NIPS. This is work in progress as we are now starting to wait for the adults to come out. So very quickly, within three and a half years, we've been able to uh, get through seven of these 10 steps. Uh, we are now assaying for promoters, both you saw the example of IE, 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 OPIE2. Um, we are also looking for uh, germline and uh, somatic promoter. Uh, constitutive promoters from sharpshooter. We've identified actins. We've identified uh, male potentially male-specific beta-2 tubulin, vassar, et cetera, and they're under testing at the moment. Um, so in a, in a relatively short time, we've been able to uh, really, we, I, we haven't caught up with the established systems like uh, mosquitoes and uh, drosophila, um, Suzuki eye, for example, I'm shying away from Melanogaster, but no, we're, we're pretty quickly now we've established Sharpshooter as a pretty good model for hemipterin genetics. And so now we are seriously considering and actually working on developing, almost said mosquitoes, uh, Sharpshooters that uh, could be refractory to the transmission of um, Xylella fastidiosa. So if we're talking about the possibilities of what we need for gene drive or say any genetic manipulation, we need a chromosomal assembly. We have that. Uh, we actually did pair matings that, that showed that neither cinnabar nor white were sex linked in sharpshooter. And that was subsequently confirmed by the uh, chromosomal assembly done uh, um, out of Nancy Moran's lab. We've established ge efficient gene delivery. We make genetic lines. We have a, an efficient somatic screening platform. We have, a sex, we, we have the ability, potential to manipulate sex determination. Uh, we've identified bioinformatics, 
bioinformatically constitutive promoters and germline specific promoters in the testing. We know fluorescent promote fluorescent proteins other than GFP work. And uh, we're actually now exploring and have identified potential affected genes from uh, that could be used in sharpshooter to generate a line of a genetic line of sharpshooter that may be incapable of transmitting xylella after the sharpshooter has fed on um, uninfected plants. So if we are going to do gene drive, population replacement or population suppression, as I pointed out before, there are some things we need to think about. Regardless of what the gene, what the model of gene drive might be, what we really need to pay attention to is an economic model. Because both males and females inflict damage on the plant, so both are transmitting the pathogen, um, you, know, you don't have the ability to release males of a particular strain that may then enact um, gene drive if those males themselves are capable of transmitting the pathogen. The growers would never tolerate that. There can be no economic loss to the growers at any stage during the development of this technology. So that's actually quite a high bar to pass. But if we are capable, if we think we can develop a strain of sharpshooter that is absolutely incapable of transmitting the pathogen, then such a release could be contemplated. The other question to think about is, well, you know, is it possible to combine a replacement strategy with a suppression strategy at the same time? What I understand occurs in mosquitoes is that you're looking at either population suppression or elimination or population replacement so that the strain can't uh, vector um, plasmodium. Maybe you can do both in sharpshooter and maybe what we're actually exploring at the moment is to see, well, if we can make this strain that is completely refractory to xylella, then at the same time, maybe we can uh, harness uh, the, beta, the, the, male specific, the male germline specific beta-2 tubulin promoter and uh, find a way to eliminate uh, the production of X, um, X bearing sperm from the male. And we haven't done any great, any um, detailed mod modeling it yet, but that is coming along fairly soon. But at the moment, we feel that this is a viable strategy to at least contemplate. Some advantages here in using genetic control strategies for sharpshooter uh, is that it's an invasive pest in California. And the uh, survey work done by Jones et al. in 2019 um, illustrated that there's public support for eliminating invasive insect pests, provided they don't do any, there's no human health risk. Um, we can also now, with uh, CRISPR technology, make the release strain specific for the target field population. Uh, we can do the release in a managed system like a farm in um, California, which is a little different than... Um, releasing mosquitoes in a, in a natural environment, for example, in Africa. And we believe we can also come up with a strategy that will also eliminate the, uh, the release strain once the field population has been eliminated. Let's quickly switch to white flies. It's a, a very different, um, um, it's a niptra, um, but it's different than sharpshooter in some important ways. Um, so it, it infects over 500 plant species. It's a pest of global agriculture. Uh, sharpshooter feeds on xylem, white fly on phloem. It, it, it excretes vast amounts of honeydew that is loaded with uh, sugars that supports sooty mold growth. Uh, and it's been sequenced. It has a 615 megabase genome. It has 10 chromosomes, but it's haplodiploid and it's not, uh, it doesn't have the exo system. So males are haploid, females are diploid. Here are some examples. Um, Biocontrol has been effective in greenhouses, but um, not so much in the field. It has a very short life cycle, maybe 20 days at uh, 28 degrees. It's highly fecund. Um, it's a fantastic genetic organism to work with in the lab because you are getting many generations per year. And as you'll see, we can contain them in an incubator uh, once we have done the genetic manipulations. Um, it has developed resistance worldwide very quickly. Of course, it's highly fecund. It has a short generation time. And there is great fear in many developing countries in the world that the insecticide resistance strains such as MED and MED species, such as MED1 and uh, MEME1, will start invading if they have not already uh, areas where um, 
there are very essential crops. And one that we are interested in is cassava in Africa. So um, it's a, it, it is a big threat to the global um, food supply. And so because of insecticide resistance, new approaches are needed. So this is an example of the potential for white fly to spread. This is from a paper by Criticos et al. from 2020. It's showing the echoclimatic index of um, where, based on projections of temperature and uh, humidity, uh, white fly could populate. Uh, so going back to sharpshooter, we're interested in sharpshooter in California in, uh, in, in vineyards. Here is a very different kettle of fish. This is white fly, which is a global pest. You could actually see where some of the strains which are insecticide resistant, such as meme one and med, currently are on the east coast of Australia and India uh, through the Mediterranean. Um, so just the, the potential for white fly to spread is immense. And we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa where cassava is a major food source. So uh, it's a tiny, it, micro-injections are difficult, um, but uh, there's lots of good things about white fly. It's, a, it's, it's actually a great, uh, it, it, it's, it should be a great genetic model because of its uh, short generation time and fecundity. And in some ways, it's, it's like Drosophila melanogaster. Well, we were in, we had to find a way to inject these uh, whilst they were on the leaf. We could not get a, we could not find an easy way to inject them on living leaves because they're so small and there's so many of them. And so we adapted a, a leaf disc method that was originally developed in its, its 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 original form by Molly Hunter at University of Arizona, and we stumbled upon a, a, a variation of this technique where we found a way for these leaf discs to make roots by treating with an oxen. And to summarize the technique of these leaf discs is that we cut a leaf out, we grow it on phyto, phyto agar with some supplements and with auxins, with an auxin. That stimulates the growth of roots. We then put the uh, gravid females onto this, root, this leaf disc about six or seven or eight days after the, the disc was made. It's now a, a functioning leaf. It's turgid. It's getting nutrients from the agar. And it's been able to maintain uh, phloem and xylem pressure such that the white fly can feed, the eggs are on that disc, and we can complete easily complete the life cycle of white fly on these discs, and uh, we can maintain um, subsequent generations on these discs in an incubator, not in a greenhouse. Now, be aware that we are still responsible, we're still dependent on a greenhouse and large insectaries for our core colony of white flies so we can get the numbers of eggs we need for injections. But in terms of manipulations of how to grow contained strains thereafter, this is a great technique. And we've actually extended this uh, some of this technology over into sharpshooter. Uh, we do micro injections into uh, the embryos. And you can actually see here that we did a lot of development at determining the correct angle of attack uh, using quartz needles. Uh, these sort of bend on the pedestal. So we try and eliminate tearing of the corian and the uh, and the eggshell and we use the uh, diagonal function of uh, sutter of sutter injectors to also minimize the amount of tearing that would happen if we were just using the x or z axis for micro injection we needed to understand when to best inject some excellent uh, um, staining of nuclei was done by an undergraduate in our laboratory simran sandu who's now at medical school at uh, george washington uh, u in uh, in dc and uh, she did some some beautiful work on on on, on uh, showing the, the rate of um, nuclear division in pre-blastoderm whiteflies. Uh, here's some examples of her excellent work, uh, and we are comparing it with Drosophila. So uh, time to say little blastoderm and Drosophila is 90 minutes, to Bassi a little longer. We deduced that uh, we could inject up to six to seven hours after overposition in order to. Um, in order to, to get the efficient mutagenesis. And I'll show you the data for that in just a moment. This is just the numerical uh, presentation of Simran's data after, after scoring uh, many, 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 many um, stains. And here's an example of how we inject whitefly directly. And this is Simran uh, driving the plane and she's just injecting uh, food dye and uh, using all the parameters that we established. And um, there you are. So that was actually done at three hours injection. Uh, we used the white gene. Once again, um, we, we tried originally four guide RNAs. One works the best. Here are some examples of mutagenesis of white in white fly. A male on the right, uh, it's uh, non it's non transgenic sib on the left. We have examples of mosaicism with the, with the uh, flies on the right. 
um, canonical um, CRISPR mutagenesis at white. Um, simply, here's the PAM site. Uh, here's the guide RNA. The cut will initial cut will occur three base pairs upstream. You can see the types of mutagenesis we're getting. We then wanted to actually determine which uh, time was the best to inject. We did uh, a time course experiment where we injected uh, at one, two, three, up to eight hours uh, post overposition using the Liftis method. We did Amplicon, we, we, we harvested the embryos um, five or six days post injection, that is the living embryos. Um, and uh, we did Amplicon sequencing and looked for mutations at the white two guide RNA site. And you can see we started to see these mutations through Amplicon sequencing at three hours. And at the moment, when we do we do direct micro injections into the embryos, you know, it's uh, we we still are wondering sometimes is it three hours or seven hours? At the moment, we uh, we, we oscillate between uh, which, which are the best times, but we believe that uh, we have a nice a nice range to work with. However, there are problems with white, and this has actually been starting to see in many other insects. I know with um, milkweed bug, um, you know, that it's lethal. Um, I think it's also been shown to be lethal in maybe in, in some other leopard, in some lepidoptera as well. And there's clearly, even with uh, Morgan's original white mutant in Drosophila, there are behavioral problems. And you can actually see that some of these white mutants look uh, look pretty messed up phenotypically. So we're looking for other mutations. Uh, vermilion is one where we've had success in. So here's a G0 male, and he has uh, vermilion eyes, um, some other examples. We've sequenced uh, those, uh, once again, using... Um, Amplicon sequencing, and we get um, we get mutagenesis. So, uh, can we do gene drive with, or, or genetic control? We'll just talk about gene drive and haplodiploids. There are two papers in this area: one published by ourselves, uh, and the other with um, and from uh, Jackson Champers Lab in uh, Beijing. And uh, one thing that both papers illustrated is that uh, drive in a haplodiploid will move slower than in a diploid because uh, it can only occur in the females, which are have 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 uh, are diploid. It cannot occur in males where there's only one copy of the chromosomes. So those are the two papers. Um, the, the the opportunities are for developing or testing this system in in white flies is that well, we're not talking about release, but in terms of the laboratory, the high fecundity and short generation time is that we can really do these. Ex we should be able to do these experiments quite rapidly in the lab, and you know being able to get say ten generations in one year see how these particular drives would work in, in a laboratory environment. There are no health impacts. The challenges would be um, how to contain it within a particular species of whitefly. In other words, doing a, a private drive using private alleles. But these days, if you can actually get comprehensive genomic sequences from the populations of the two species in the target area, you could make it specific. Um, but what Champer also showed, we sort of concluded from our analysis that your drive could work in a replacement strategy. Uh, but Champer actually showed uh, in his work that uh, if they, under some conditions, if you targeted female fertility genes, then you could get uh, population suppression in a haplodiploid. So it would be very exciting to see if we could identify female fertility genes in whitefly and do this type of testing in the laboratory using the uh, leaf disk system and then a, a larger plant system uh, that we that we already have in in our lab to test these um to test the, the veracity of gene drive. So I think it's achievable. I think it's testable in the lab, and because of uh, the the great genetic properties of whitefly in the lab, it's we should be able to do uh, to do these studies in a laboratory environment. So finally, um, we have two groups uh, in the lab. This uh, I am one of the two PIs. Linda Walling is my colleague from the uh, Department of Botany and Plant Sciences here. She's a plant geneticist uh, working on the uh, on uh, plant insect interactions with whitefly and now with sharpshooter. Our sharpshooter team is shown on the top line. Uh, that's the current state. And we have a good collaboration with Rodrigo Almeida at, um, at Berkeley. Uh, get lots of good ideas about uh, target, which genes we should be targeting for sharpshooter control. And then our whitefly team, and Simran actually should be down as a past member, but I put her up here because she was with us for, for five for, for five years, actually, as an undergraduate and did some stunning work. And I showed you the uh, the, uh, the stunning work that she did. Uh, these are um, these are our members. And uh, the, the, the Gene Drive publication was uh, done in collaboration with Bruce Tabashnik at the uh, University of Arizona and uh, Shai Marin at uh, 
Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and these are our funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Peter. Really, uh, really interesting work. And uh, yeah, the technology development and the rapidity with which you uh, were able to uh, accomplish that was, was really impressive. So uh, let me just say to the audience, uh, please uh, feel free to ask any kind of question that you'd like, technical or a discussion point or whatever. You can do that in two ways now. Uh, you can chat that in if you'd like to do it uh, uh, using the chat function. Or if you raise your hand, we can actually uh, unmute you and you can you can ask your question orally. And um, so feel free to ask Peter uh, any anything. We have a couple of questions, Peter, but before I get to that, them, I'm going to ask a couple of myself. And uh, so um, with regard to uh, glassy wing sharpshooter, which has some significant um, economic impacts and is sort of a local is a, is a local pest local with respect to uh, continental local. Um, I know you've interacted a bit, had some engagement with growers or grower groups, and I'm just wondering if you could, you know, talk a little bit about some of your experiences with them uh, in talking to them about genetic technologies and uh, you know and the prospects of of technologies perhaps to help solve some of their problems and what their some of their reactions might have been. Uh, I, I haven't had direct interactions with them as yet. What we Our work is funded by the uh, Pierce's Disease Sharpshooter Board, which is um, a, uh, in, it's, it's, um, it's uh, growers in working with the CDFA here in California, and they uh, have a voluntary self-tax, which, uh, which then supports research into these insects. So uh, we still talk uh, primarily with the CDFA uh, as our liais as a liaison to the growers. However, in the next month, we will be talking with uh, those those um, people at a at a conference in the Napa Valley. So we haven't had a direct interaction, but the presentations that we make in order to get funding are reviewed by them. And so this is seen as a viable technology. Um, um, that, that needs to be developed as a potential control agent, as a good potential control strategy for um, for growers. But we do need to have a very intimate relationship with them, especially moving forward now, because now that we've actually been, I'd say, extremely successful in developing gene knockout, um, gene insertion, and we'll soon have these promoters functioning, we are now at the step where we're developing these strains. So we have, we have, good interactions with Rodrigo in terms of trying to figure out what things to target. Um, but I'm looking forward in the next uh, month or two that we'll have uh, more one-on-one -on -one interactions with the actual growers. Yeah. Well, the fact that they're, they're using their, uh, uh, it's a commodity board basically that's funding you. And so uh, yeah. uh, they're probably, I think that's a, that's a good sign uh, at least. So uh, I'm going to ask one more question on Whitefly, and then I'm going to go to the uh, to, to the questions that uh, from the audience. And again, let me encourage the audience to ask uh, any kind of questions that you'd like to uh, to extract more uh, information from Peter and to get him to talk more about these projects. They're they're really interesting and uh, and and really um, really groundbreaking in the sense that that as again these systems have not been explored extensively as genetic systems, and it's quite clear that they they. they they have a lot of interesting features. I want to go to the white fly, and I wanted to ask you about just some thoughts. I mean, white fly is uh, a very complex. Uh, I don't know if it's one species or not. It's hard to say how people think about that these days. I mean, they used to call them biotypes, but then, you know, now, um, now there, now I think there's some some talk about actually calling them uh, individual species. Anyway, there there are a there is a lot of diversity in terms of their. Um, host plant specificity, uh, et cetera. And um, how, do you, how do you, I mean, how do you think about that in terms of moving forward with the genetic uh, genetic approach where this kind of yeah. genetic diversity might be really uh, confounding? Yeah, good point. I, and and if Linda was here, I think I'd, I'd, I'd handball the question to her. Uh, we call them a species. Actually, when I was doing my rehearsals, I was calling them uh, strains and Linda corrected me to say they're species, so we'll call them species. Um, ultimately, you know, what we grow them on here is Linda. We have meme one here, and uh, Linda has been growing that on brassica for, for many, many years, and it works 
really well. Um, and we can continue to work with it. I mean, that is the foundation of our leaf disc method, but we're also interested in, if needed, if we can ex you know, extend that to uh, other other plant species. We we have tried it with some others, and uh, but many of them don't have this response to the auxins that um, Brassica has. But that doesn't answer your question. The, the question really will come up with uh, control. So if we're actually going to do it, if one is contemplating a release strategy, then one has to be targeting that host plant. And if we're talking about cassava, um, which we you know we we are not rearing them on at the moment, then um, clearly the manipulations that we're doing for a release strain, I would imagine, would have to be in that particular uh, strain that is already, um, I'll just say, nat species. There you go. That is naturally adapted um, to cassava. Um, I think as you're getting to that stage, you would probably be wanting to do some fairly interesting, some, some fairly detailed studies of what hand, post hand, host plant preference would be um, if you actually went ahead with the release. So, if we took took the example of cassava in a in Tanzania or Uganda, uh, okay, what other plants are there? Are uh, there they potential hosts? What's the what what are the possible interactions that could happen that could be good, that could be bad? Um, in a sense, that broad question is no different than what I imagine confronts those who are contemplating releasing mosquitoes in Africa. I mean, you're asking what's going to be the level of interaction with the um, with the ecology, and here with plant feeding insects, that's a pretty big deal. Um, so it's, the, the bottom line is it's testable. I mean, it's, it's not as if you can't get those answers. Uh, you can, and it's just a question of experimental experimental design and identifying those host plants that are the most likely hosts of whitefly in that area. I will also point out that I didn't say in the seminar that you know whitefly uh, trans transmits many viruses, um, over 500 plant viruses, primarily begoma viruses, and doing gene editing in whitefly does open the possibility, open up the possibility that one could potentially engineer resistance to one or several of those viruses. Um, so you now getting back to the idea of replacement as opposed to suppression or elimination, you know, could you make a, a whitefly that could not transmit cassava virus to cassava? Is that a solution or is it not? So that's one aspect that is uh, also very enticing about white fly. Okay, good. Thanks. I'm going to go to our questions now. And again, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to uh, ask a question. And if you do, I'll actually uh, let you cut the line. Uh, so I'll encourage you to uh, ask it orally. So uh, the first question here, Peter, I think you can actually see it, but it's from um, uh, Motion Raza. Uh, first of all, he says, you know, it's it's great to listen to you and he, uh, and they have read your paper. So that's good. So uh, what's the most feasible developmental stages uh, on, on insects suitable for CRISPR-Cas mutation experiments? So maybe this is, um, maybe this is specific to your system. I think you mentioned a little bit about this. So the, the, sorry, the question is what are the best developmental stages to target? Mm. I think so. Okay. You, you, um, well, um, you don't not not for micro injection. It's uh, we do the micro injection in the embryos, and then the question would be, what developmental systems can you then interrogate? Is that is that what? That could happen? be. I, I mean, I, I think that's an interpretation. That would yeah, be good. Okay. Um, right. I'm going, to, I'm going to say the sky's the limit again. I, I'd say that it, it's a thrill working with the hemimetabolous insect because of the. Um, you know, the adult body plan appearing uh, during late embryogenesis. And then certainly with the nymphs, um, you know, the wings, certainly the wings don't appear until much later during the, the immature stage. But, you know, you have the ability, I think, to interrogate uh, embryonic development. You have the ability to interrogate um, nymph development uh, and adult development. Um, we we have looked at, I, I can't go into it because it's, um, it's 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 work with another group, um, and, and um, but you know we have we have looked at a a gene which um, doesn't have a, a phenotype, uh, a, a, an early phenotype. It has an a, an adult phenotype, 
and um, you know we we can potentially we can see uh, those changes um, because we can do um, genotyping with the exuvia of the G0s um, and we can tag that exuvia to a particular animal. If we get mutagenesis in a target gene, you know, it's, it's a gene involved, potentially involved in development at some stage, we can actually identify that individual as a nymph and say, okay, we want him or her. We can't identify the sex until very late uh, fifth, fifth instar. But we, okay, we want that one and we want that one. And we can actually collect those, which is what we've done, and breed from those to get a line, which would then, in your case of a developmental question, then generate that line, which would provide you with with mutations in that gene. And then you could actually see, assuming they're not lethal, you could see what the outcome would be. Yeah. So I, I this is this system um, for sharpshooter, and I, I think soon with Whitefly uh, is very amenable to that. I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug for Whitefly in that unlike sharpshooter, the Whitefly nymphs, other than the wanderers in the first insta, are sessile, and they're transparent. Um, so sometimes I'd like to believe that whitefly has the potential to be uh, something like the zebrafish of vertebrates. You know, if you're thinking of tagging genes during development, um, imagine that you do this with whitefly and you have some uh, nymphs that are sessile on a leaf disc, and you can circle those with a with, you know, with a marker on, on the back of the Petri dish and just watch development uh, at a fixed point um, during um, those 10 days from um, from hatch nymph to adult. Uh, that that's that's pretty sensational. And that is, I'd say, within reach. Um, yeah. I, I totally agree. They're totally <laughs> fantastic <laughs> insects. And uh, yeah, I mean the immobile nymphs with perfectly clear cuticle uh, it, yeah. they're just absolutely it, it's, uh, it, it, it really has the potential to be the zebra fish of uh, invertebrates. Ab absolutely a dream. They're small, but they're they have so they're small. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> just gonna follow up with uh, with uh, motions, one other question, which was, and this is sort of, you know, sort of a general question, but it's good. So what what might be the advantage? I think of what, he, what, what the question is here is what might be the advantage of a genetic control over traditional crops, crop control strategy? So, or insect control strategy. So um, you mean chemicals? Yeah. And I think maybe, maybe think, talk about this in terms of uh, glassy wing sharpshooter. So, um, so within the context of glassy wing sharpshooter, um, what other, why would genetic control perhaps be attractive relative to traditional methods that are being used now? Well, the methods that are being used now are quarantine. So that's effective, but it's 24-7 um, and it's costly in terms of labor and um, you know, maintaining that um, inspections. Um, it's probably also inevitably leaky, uh, you know, given the size of California and, uh, and uh, trade uh, between north and south. Um, chemicals, for the reasons I pointed out, are, are do work. Chemical insecticides do work, but they come at a cost. Uh, and it's becoming, I think, increasingly a less acceptable cost. Um, genetic control, especially now in the era of CRISPR, can be absolutely precise. I mean, we can target a particular gene, uh, make alleles. We can be sure through um, sequencing of those strains that there are no other mutations. I mean, this, you know, in terms of you know, legal questions about, you know, Dr. Atkinson, are you sure this was the only change? Uh, yes, Your Honor, this was the only change. Um, you can, if you look at some of Austin Burt's papers uh, in terms of private alleles, uh, you have the ability uh, with Sharpshooter to say, well, um, we can make this particular strain uh, that will eliminate or replace or do both uh, in the field specific to the uh, Californian population, or we could even make it specific to the population in um, pick a county or pick a pick an area. Uh, and it could not uh, function in a population, a native population on in the Southeast United States where sharpshooter is native. And so I, I know from uh, talking this issue with Rick, uh, who has been working with um, growers and the CDFA on uh, sharpshooter control, Rick, Rick Reddick, that is, uh, for, for more than more than 25 years. Um, you know, we, we, and he actually does have contact with the growers that um, 
anything that uh, is put in as a controlling agent, be it genetic or classic biological control that could escape to the north, the southeast, I should say. Did I say northeast? Southeast, um, um, you know, is not acceptable. So, you know, if we looked at, you know, Austin Burt's ideas of private alleles, you know, something that is absolutely genetic contained, genetically contained to a private population, I think that this type of CRISPR technology uh, provides the ability to do all that. And, and um, it's this exquisite control. I, I, this is why I'd say CRISPR is revolutionary and why in human medicine, you know, a disease like sickle cell anemia, which was a classic genetic disease for which we had no treatment, is now there is now a treatment. Um, that, that this, is, this, is, this is just another example of it. Great. So I'm going to go on to another question here by uh, Simon Lilico. Um, this is a technical question. When you did the template-based reversion in Sharpshooter, did you look for off-target integration of the HDR template? No, we haven't done that yet. The work in progress. We, we've just simply done... Um, done uh, if Ina's on the line, she'll correct me if I spoke incorrectly. And I really should, I, I actually, I'm glad that question came up because I really should have uh, pointed out uh, for the sharpshooter work, Ina Pacheco, Pacheco is a, a postdoc from Brazil and she's been working on this sharpshooter project for um, coming up to three years now. And she has been absolutely sensational in uh, and, and um, amazingly productive and uh, in, in doing it. Much of what I was talking about is uh, done with Ina's hands and Ina's mind. Uh, so the, the characterization of the revertence is still in progress. Uh, we, we're getting ready to submit that for uh, publication in the next few months. That We have not addressed that as yet. So good question. Yeah. Glad, glad he asked it, so we should follow up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, Sampath Kumar has a question. Uh, really general one, but a uh, good one. Apart from sap-sucking insects, can the gene drive technology be used in lepidopteran pests such as the uh, fall armyworms, where the release of manipulated pests is not a possibility? Hmm. I'm going to ask you that, Dave. That's probably... Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> well, I guess the question is, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I guess I'm, uh, Sampath, I guess I'm a little bit, um, the last part of your question was, uh, threw me a little bit off. Um, so could gene drive be potentially useful lepidopter and pests? I, I certainly, in, in theory, that, that could be a yes. Um, for that particular pest, you, you know, it's, it would be, it's a maybe uh, as well. Um, I'm not sure what you meant by the release of the manipulated pest is not, not possible. So, um, currently the only way, well, there are natural gene drives, but most people are making uh, engineered gene drives. And so any gene drive system in, in full army would, would have to be a manipulated pest. But if you want to clarify that Kumar, uh, feel free to do that in the chat or raise your hand and we can get back to it. Uh, Mark Benedict has a question. Mark, uh, hi. For, so is uh, Xylella responsible for diseases caused in plants other than grapes? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, um, Xylella is, um, I, I showed some examples of other, other um, crops uh, in, uh, in Europe at the moment, especially in the uh, heel of Italy. Um, but, uh, um, I think a spittle bug is responsible for vectoring uh, Xylella and that's decimating uh, the olive groves in um, far southern Italy. And uh, I believe that uh, I could be wrong, but I, but I, I, well, what I would be, what I am sure of is um, that clearly growers in other Mediterranean countries around, around in the basin are concerned about uh, the spread. And I think, um, I think there has been evidence of. Pierce's disease, which is the, the disease caused by Xylella in um, Israel, um, just uh, my, my geography is not great, but I think it's just uh, west of the Golan Heights. Um, one, one of the really neat things about um, working on um, on this insect and, and this, uh, we, we don't work with the bacteria at the moment, although we're about to, uh, and, and all, all credit to Rodrigo here, who is probably not online, um, we have, uh, through his efforts at uh, Berkeley, um, and he's been working uh, on, on sharpshooter and Zyzala primarily for um, many decades. Uh, during um, both semesters, we have um, 
a Zylella um, workshop seminar every, uh, usually every Tuesday morning. And this is international. And um, this is answering your question, Mark, in a roundabout way. Um, we, we have speakers and attendees and 40, 60 speakers, att attendees um, um, from the United States, Southeast, uh, from California and from Europe and from Brazil, um, elsewhere. And um, it's focused on Xylella and, you know, and Sharpshooter is one component of that. But, you know, you can certainly have Xylella you know, bacterial genetics, bacterial biochemistry talks. And um, we've been attending those and, and Ina has actually spoken in one of them. Um, and uh, we, we learn a lot about it. And, it's, and what, Re, what, Re, what Rigo's done uh, in convening this, uh, this group over the past few years has been, at least, especially for me, you know, who came into this project with uh, a huge amount of ignorance, um, is, is been uh, a great example of how um, researchers around around the world can get together, and so when I talk about Zylella in Italy, it's because I've been attending these these meetings and hearing these talks from uh, from Italian scientists, and actually seeing the decimation that uh, Zylella has caused to families in southern Italy who have had their generational crops of olive trees um, wiped out uh, through this disease. It's 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 heartbreaking. Yeah, interesting. I, I if if uh, some a lot of these uh, plant sucking insects, white fly in particular, I don't I know. My question is really around a glossy wing sharpshooter. Is that even if they're not transmitting diseases, if their numbers get high enough, they can impact uh, the plants just by the the sheer volume of, of fluids they're they're removing from these these plants. Yeah. So if you if you had a um, a sharp uh, a glossy wing sharpshooter that was resistant to xylella um and you had a replacement strategy you'd still have them out in the out in the field would they be a, essentially a, just a a, a a nuisance at that point or would they still be a pest I, don't, I i can't give you a yes or no answer certainly the the basis of its of its um impact on on grape and and the other crops has been through the transmission of the bacteria yeah. and so it's my understanding at the moment that you know zylella Sorry, um, sharpshooter could be tolerated if it was not a pet, if it was not mm -hmm. vectoring this this pathogen. But that is something we would have to test. Um, you are most, you are most certainly right with whitefly. Uh, you know, in Linda's colonies up up in the insectaries in the back. Uh, you know, I have a photo behind me over there which you can't see of an infested uh, leaf. Uh, they they can suck the uh, the phloem out of the plant and end up, you can end up with a, with a wilted plant independent of any virus uh, it's it's quite um it's quite it's quite graphic um, yeah uh Frederick Kumu has a has an interesting question and I'm glad he asked it because it, it's it's a good one to 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 linger on first of all hi Fred Rose and uh can you explain one more time how you would combine suppression and replacement drives for the control of these pests so this is certainly something that's been an idea that's you know f been floating around in in the mosquito world as, as to how compatible these two different strategies might be so yeah yeah uh, it's, it's a great question and in fact um yesterday in, in preparing for this you know I, I started scribbling on on a notepad again about how to do this and uh, I'm, I'm looking at my acknowledgement screen and i want to uh, shout out jun lee who is uh, in our department of statistics here and uh, was the uh, prime author on um the, uh, the 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 gene drive strategy uh, on whitefly that, uh, that 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 Bruce championed um, uh, some years back when we published, and this is going to be a question that is going to go to Jun Lee and from me quite soon in terms of um, you know can we actually let's let's have a look at the modelling. Um, assuming we can make a strain of sharpshooter that is absolutely refractory to infection, and I. I believe we can do that, um, give, given the progress we've made uh, in the last, you know, two and a half, three and a half years. I, I think that um, you know, it, it's quite realistic to contemplate, develop, finding and developing such a strain. Um, could we then use that as the release strain, which I think, as I pointed out, for economic reasons, is basically mandatory, right? Is there a way of combining that? With uh, say a shredding system where the uh, as has has been shown by by the uh, the group in Imperial um, uh, and and I think um, others in Medfly I can't recall the 
paper from um, Pepper Thanos, but um, but it's feasible. So if you could actually combine uh, shredding of the X-bearing sperm in males with in X-bearing sperm in in males so that you will not get females in the next generation leading to suppression. And at the same time, any males that survive, the males that are surviving from the release strain are refractory, then I think it's possible to reduce the population numbers down in the field to the point where you would have elimination. Now, the question is, how quickly will that occur? And that's where the modeling is. That gets down to what's the starting population of the field population. And if, it, if I go back to um, this this paper from uh, from CSIRO uh, on um, uh, from Ligus uh, Ligus um, on the potential benefits of doing gene drive in agriculture on managed systems. So, in other words, there's your plot, there's your area. You know, that's an acreage, and you know you have a you have a boundary, if you will, very different than release of Anopheles in Africa, if you, if you like, uh, in, in its native environment. Then if you know the, the target population size and you've done the modeling, then you can say, okay, I need to be making so many numbers of release and I'm going to be releasing um, you know, at, at these particular times. So I think that is quite feasible. Um, but it, but it requires the detailed modeling. But it's a great question because it's a challenge. But I believe it's addressable. Yep. Yeah, could you uh, say a little bit more about Xylella and its interactions with with the host? I guess uh, in terms of trying to help conceptualize what a refractory, okay. how you so, might achieve refractoriness in in that in that insect. Um, you know, how how does how does this bacteria live? Uh, in in the in the insect um what compartments would, yeah. would you access it yeah so if rodrigo was here he he would give a, a far more detailed answer than me so I'll, I'll try and um summarize that so uh i should have pointed out that this is passive transmission so that uh, zydala is more or less a flying syringe and those from the mosquito world you know where we're used to um virus is obviously being passaged through the female um, and then uh, reappearing in the uh, saliva. It's a very different system. Um, so what Rodrigo and his team and others have shown over the years is that uh, Xylella um, is obviously imbibed by the, uh, by the mouth parts and uh, it concentrates in the foregut of sharpshooter and um, it grows in population size uh, in a particular, in, in, in the foregut, but it is really, really concentrated in a, a structure. It's not an organ. It's a structure called the presoberium chamber, which, and he has beautiful electron micrographs of Xylella uh, sitting in this uh, in this chamber, which is very, very small. So whilst it's you know certainly in the other mouth parts, it's it's certainly sitting in that chamber, and that's where it's uh, most condensed. So what we are thinking of doing is that if we can find a way to prevent Xylella from adhering to the cuticle of um, the foregut and spe specifically the presoberium chamber, then when that insect is feeding on an infected plant, the Xylella will just simply be flushed through the alimentary canal and out at the anus. Uh, and that uh, transmission to the, uh, the Xylella of the sharpshooter then going from the infected plant to an uninfected plant to subsequently feed would um, would be reduced and ideally eliminated. So it, it's very different than um, targeting genes in a mosquito, say in the midgut epithelia or in uh, in the hemocyl or in the uh, or in the salivary glands. So the bacteria would not be exposed to saliva in the mouth parts. Uh, if, no, it's exposed. It's, it's exposed to saliva, and uh, one approach we have thought about but are not pursuing is, well, can you engineer the saliva, you know, uh, to uh, produce a, a a protein, you know, that could also affect uh, transmission. Uh, that's not what we're pursuing at the moment, but it's it's potential. It's a, yeah. it's something worth considering. Yeah. Super. Okay. Great. I don't see. Any other questions, either on the chat or 
and uh, anybody raise their hands and so I think uh, and it's 12 25 uh, so I think we're good I think we can probably just wrap it up let me uh, I'll, I'll thank you in a second Peter uh, but before I do uh, I wanted to say for those of you still on the line that this is the last webinar in this particular series of webinars that were on emerging systems emerging gene drive systems uh, we will pick up uh, Gene Convene Global Collaborative webinar program will pick up uh after the summer and we've yet to determine what the, that series will look like but i'm sure it'll be really interesting and i hope you will be able to join us then and you will get notification of what that is since you're on our we have your email and your mailing our mailing list and we'll be happy to notify you when that is scheduled so with that um let me uh let me thank peter again for uh, taking the time to give this webinar and to talk about some really cool insects and some fantastic progress in the you know developing of genetic tools to allow not just the not just the development of potentially genetic control strategies but really to uh to develop ways of 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 getting into the biology of these insects like we've never done before so peter thanks a lot and thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, good. With that, I'll say uh, thanks to the audience and look forward to seeing you again uh, when our next webinar series takes place. So with that, have a nice day, everybody.